Thank you very much for joining us here today. Could you tell us your name and your work, please? My name is Ken Henshaw. Um, I work with an NGO called Social Action in Nigeria. I'm an environmental rights campaigner. Nigeria is a country rich in oil. Yes. Uh, has that made it a country uh, rich and prosperous for all its citizens? Absolutely not. Can you explain how that's possible? Well, um, well, Nigeria um, used to be, I mean, until recently, um, it was something close to the sixth largest exporter of crude oil in the world. And the only people who have made wealth, who have become prosperous due to Nigeria's um, oil industry, have been a clique of politicians and oil companies. Surely that can't be true. I'm looking at the ExxonMobil Nigeria homepage right now, and they say... We believe maximizing energy resources goes beyond energy production. Developing human capital through education builds a foundation that transforms the future. In your experience, has that been Exxon's work in Nigeria? Absolutely untrue. I mean, um, I'm sure that the majority of people who live in the Niger Delta in Nigeria have never read that thing they have up there. They will probably pull down the website. <laughs> um, um, for a long time, also in Nigeria, uh, there's been um, a correlation between oil production and human rights problems. Can you tell us briefly a little bit about the story of Ken Sarawiwa and others in the Niger Delta? I think that was on the, on the, on the 10th of November, 1995. I had traveled to attend my grandmother's burial. I had just gained admission into the university. And in the midst of the celebration, somebody came to me and said, Ken Sarawa had been hung. He was sentenced. We were waiting for an appeal to be filed. But the military dictatorship in Nigeria didn't wait. I mean, business had to go on. Ken had been accused of masterminding the killing of four Ogonis. But in reality, Ken had been blackmailed by the oil companies because he had started a movement called the Movement for the Survival of Ogoni People, calling for justice to be done. Now, Ogoni land is a land in Niger Delta that oil has been extracted nonstop for over 50 years. It is one of the poorest communities in the entire country. The environment in that place has been terribly devastated and polluted. Livelihood sources have been compromised. The people are principally fishermen and farmers. The farms no longer, longer yield. The waters have been so polluted that the rivers are basically dead, dead rivers. I don't know if you've ever seen a dead river. Fishes can live there, crabs can live there, nothing lives there. You know, and this was what Sarah was um, protesting. And he mobilized his people. A series of actions were, were carried out. And the oil companies, specifically Shell, felt that he had threatened the interests of the company. At a point, oil exploration had basically stopped in Ogoni land. They had stopped drilling oil in Ogoni land. And for that, the military dictatorship in Nigeria had to hang him. Africa is sometimes described as the continent suffering most dramatically so far from the effects of climate change. Have you begun to see those effects in parts of Nigeria as temperatures rise? Yes, yes we have. Can you describe them for us, please? Well, um, in the Niger Delta where I live in 2012, there was, a, there was massive flooding in the Niger Delta. Um, sea levels rose by close to, what, 15, 15 meters or thereabout. Houses were completely submerged. An entire farming season disappeared, you know. People and were unable to plant. Absolutely not. I mean, even those who had planted waiting for harvest, I mean, everything got washed off completely, completely washed off. Sea levels rose. People left their houses. Because the rain had been so intense. The rain became very, very intense. And surprisingly, the, the, the sea levels, I mean, the Niger Delta borders around the the Atlantic, sea levels basically started rising, and people were surprised. I interviewed a 72-year-old man who said that in his lifetime, he had never seen anything like that. He had never seen it. And of course, also, um, I'm sure maybe you, you may be aware that in the news, Nigeria, um, Nigeria is now called um, a terrorist country due to the Boko Haram insurgency. Now, Boko Haram um, exists in a region in Nigeria that is not known for fundamentalism in the list. But that region also happens to be around the area bordering the Lake Chad. The, 
the Lake Chad in the last 30 years has shrunk to a 20th of its size. That lake used to be the source of irrigation for the entire region. That lake used to be where livestock drink. That lake used to support farming. That lake was the hub of fishing in the entire region. As the Lake Chad shrunk, people became desperate. People became destitute. People became um, criminalized. Insurgency rose, fundamentalism rose because it was easy to recruit. So yes, we trace, we trace directly the rise of Boko Haram to factors related to climate change. Indeed, that entire area has suffered from dramatic drought that made it difficult for pastoralists and herders to yes, continue their work. Absolutely. Have you met people who have uh, had to change their way of life? Oh, yes, severally. In the, in the northern region where drought has become, well, standard, you know, and also in the Niger Delta where fishing doesn't happen anymore and farming is no longer prosperous. Yes, I've met people who have changed their lifestyles. The um, CEO of Exxon, uh, Rex Tillerson, said at the last annual meeting of Exxon that if climate change happened to cause any inclement weather anywhere in the world, that we would figure out technological ways to adapt to that. Have people been able to figure out how to adapt to this kind of flooding and drought that you've seen in Nigeria? <laughs> no. I mean, nobody has. I mean, basically, when, when, the, 2000 and, I mean, the, when the 2012 floods happened, um, the oil companies inclusive went on air announcing to people that they should move to higher grounds. Whose higher ground? Whose houses? You know, not even vehicles were provided to, to move people away. So yeah, people have to work out their own you know, salvation basically by themselves. There has been no, nothing of the sort. When the last CEO of Exxon retired, he had a $400 million retirement package. To the best of your knowledge, has Exxon been providing compensation or benefits to people displaced by flood or drought in Nigeria? <laughs> Absolutely not. I mean, they don't consider it their responsibility at all to do that. In fact, what Exxon, I mean, they say, um, there used to be a monthly um, data released by the well, petroleum industry in Nigeria um, rating companies in terms of their levels of gas flaring. Exxon constantly tops that chart. So rather than do something about you know, the changing uh, climatic conditions, they are instead flaring gas. As I speak to you, gas flaring is going on unperturbed, undisturbed as we speak right now. It's most likely going to continue because these companies remain in denial. Thank you very, very much for your testimony. Thank you so much. One of the ways that humans adapt is by moving, by, by migrating. Um, Based on what you're seeing of the treatment of refugees in Europe and North America, do you believe that if Africans are forced to migrate because of climate change, that they will be welcomed? It doesn't, I don't, it doesn't feel so, no. To me right now, it does not feel so. Um, I don't, it doesn't feel so at all. I mean, I don't get the impression that if for any reason people in the Niger Delta and Nigeria who are affected by climate change had to move, they'll be welcomed. Here in Europe, no, I don't think so. And what do you feel when you hear those words from Exxon's CEO? I really feel bad because it seems to me that they don't take into consideration um, what people are passing through. And the revelations are becoming more and more dire. Um, I mean, I can tell you about a community called Bodo in Ogoni land. Um, it is the place where UNEP carried out an assessment of the environment. And it was confirmed that benzene, I, I never heard the word benzene before now, that benzene, a cancer-causing agent, is in the water people drink 900 times higher than it should be. People still drink that water now. It is the water I learned how to swim in. It is the water I drink till now. Life expectancy in the Niger Delta has drastically you know, dropped. The expectancy level is something between 43 and 46 years old in Niger Delta. If you drive into Bodo every weekend, the pastime there now are burials. What you see on each and every wall are posters announcing this burial or that burial or this burial. And every poster has got the age of the person, the deceased. It's hardly up to 50 years old. I am really, really scared because I still drink that water. On the 1st of August, I was 39 years old. If life expectancy is between 43 and 46, I'm afraid. I'm really getting scared. Thank you for your testimony.